Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, depending on where you are joining us from. We still have a full few people logging on, so we're going to give um, them a minute or two to get settled, and then we'll be on our way. Okay, so I think we are ready to go now. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for today's webinar titled Predicting the Future to Strengthen Anticipatory Actions. Um, so today's webinar is being presented to you by the Academic Alliance for Anticipatory Action, also called the four A's a consortium of seven universities in the United States, Africa, and Asia that is funded by USAID. The goal of the 4A's consortium is to increase the knowledge base of what works in anticipatory action, where, when, and for whom. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. So today's webinar is going to be recorded, is being recorded. Um, we'll be able to then share the link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your colleagues who are not able to attend today. Um, so before we begin, if you could introduce yourself in the chat, um, let us know who you are and where you're joining from. Um, we also invite your questions and comments. Please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speakers at any point, just type it in there and I will either pose it to our uh, speakers at that time or we will save it for the discussion in the end. So let's begin then. I'd like to first introduce our presenters today. My name is Arkady Sharma. I'm a researcher and PhD student at the Tufts University Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. We have Ms. Mfonyane Netale, PhD candidate at the National University of Lesotho. Mr. Chaka Natsane, commercial farmer and leading supporter, uh, supporting the transition from subsistence to commercial farming in Lesotho. We have Dr. Mahar Lagme, the Executive Director of the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute, and Ms. Ariana Rivera, the Manager of Operations Center at the Quezon City Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office. So before we begin, we have two broad questions. What is anticipatory action and what is the role of technology? So anticipatory action aims to reduce the human and economic costs, costs associated with crises such as natural disasters, disease outbreaks, or food shortages, by taking informed and strategic actions in advance. It involves the efficient allocation of resources, timely deployment of aid, and equipping vulnerable communities with the tools and resources to better protect themselves, thus enhancing their resilience and reducing the severity of the crisis impact. The integration of technology plays a pivotal role in fortifying anticipatory action efforts. Early warning systems, predictive models, and technology-based forecasting tools empower decision makers to plan and allocate resources efficiently before an event occurs. This technological advancement not only facilitates more precise and timely decision making, but also enables a more effective response to emerging challenges. Now the synergy of anticipatory action and technological tools enables the prediction, planning, and responses to crises in a timely manner that significantly reduces their impact on vulnerable populations. By fostering resilience and bolstering preparedness through advanced technology, anticipatory action contributes the to the development of effective risk management strategies that when guided by technology, work to mitigate vulnerability for at-risk populations. So today our presenters are going to be exploring this from different angles. I will be introducing Dr. Alfredo Mahara Lagme. The executive director of UPRI. Dr. Mahar is an academic academician of the National Academic of Science and Technology and professor at the National Institute of Geological Sciences the, at the University of the Philippines. He is currently the, the director of the University of the Philippines Nationwide Operations Assessment of Hazard, NOAA Center, established to conduct research, development, and extension services on natural hazards disaster risk reduction, and climate change. He is also the executive director of the University of the Philippines Resilience Institute, an institute developed by the UP system as an agent of change in the country's disaster resilience efforts. He is a recipient of the 2008 Outstanding Research Award from DOST, the 2013 Professional Regulation Commission, Outstanding Professional of the Year Award, the 2000 Outstanding Filipino Award, and the 2015 Plinius Medal of the European Geosciences Union Award. On to you, Dr. Mahar. Yes, thank you very much, Akriti. Good morning, uh, 
Maybe it's afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce you to a significant development within our organization's ongoing efforts to enhance disaster preparedness and response in the Philippines. While the Philippines currently lacks a government-led platform for anticipatory action, our team at the UP Resilience Institute is forging ahead with our latest initiative, the impact-based flood forecasting, which is integrated into the NOAA website. This exciting project not only represents a significant step forward in disaster resilience, but is firmly rooted in the principle of anticipatory action, a critical approach to proactively mitigate the impact of disasters. Flooding is a natural hazard with significant global implications. It leads to massive economic losses, disrupts livelihoods, and severely threatens public safety. In the Philippines, our vulnerability to flooding is particularly pronounced. We experience a high frequency of typhoons between June and December, and these storms can be further intensified by the southwest monsoon. The combined impact of typhoons and monsoons make flooding a recurrent and severe issue for our nation. Project NOAA, short for the Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards, was a groundbreaking initiative launched in 2012 to tackle the challenges posed by flooding and other disasters in the Philippines. Its primary mission was to provide critical support for disaster risk reduction and management, climate change adaptation, and mitigation efforts across the country. Initially developed and hosted by the Department of Science and Technology, Project NOAA's scope and impact expanded significantly after 2017 when it was adopted by the University of the Philippines under the UP Resilience Institute. NOAA's influence and reach have been nothing short of impressive. Uh, if I were to be honest about it, the platform quickly gained popularity among Filipinos and played a pivotal role in disaster preparedness and response. Alongside other government agency websites related to weather and science, NOAA became a go-to resource for accurate and timely information on weather-related hazards. According to a 22, 2022 study by the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP, NOAA is among the most heavily utilized platforms by local government units with a score of 59.7% it is tied with the Philippines Statistics Authority in terms of usage in developing community disaster risk reduction and management plans, or CIDRA, disaster risk reduction plans, or DRR plans, comprehensive development plans, or CDP plans, and contingency plans. While hazard mapping was a significant step forward in understanding disasters, NOAA aimed for a more comprehensive approach by introducing risk mapping. Hazard mapping identifies potential dangers such as flood-prone areas, while risk mapping delves deeper into the vulnerability of communities, infrastructure, and ecosystems, enabling a more targeted and effective response to disasters. Recognizing that risk mapping still left gaps in preparedness, NOAA decided to take its capabilities even further. NOAA now introduced an impact-based flood forecasting system, and this means that it can predict which specific neighborhoods are most likely to be affected by impending disasters. This level of granularity allows local authorities, humanitarian organizations, and the public to take preemptive measures tailored to their communities. The power of NOAA's neighborhood forecasting lies in its ability to empower decision makers, local government units, and humanitarian organizations can use this information as well. Priority communities at the highest risk, ensuring that limited resources are directed where they are needed most. Estimated potential flood damage, accurately aiding in allocating resources and funds for disaster response and recovery. 
as well as allocate resources efficiently and effectively, leading to a more coordinated and impactful disaster response. So how does Project NOAA achieve this level of accuracy in its forecasts? The system relies on forecast rainfall models from international sources, which are carefully calibrated to local weather conditions in the Philippines. This calibration ensures that the predictions are tailored to our specific geographical and meteorological characteristics. And as a result, NOAA can pinpoint which barangays are most likely to be affected by heavy rainfall, which translates to flooding, and calculate as well the exposure in terms of the population at risk. Let's begin by taking a closer look at our tool. What you see here is an invaluable tool for anticipatory action. This map displays a 24-hour accumulated rainfall forecast for the entire Philippines sourced from Weather Manila. By monitoring this forecast data, we can assess the risk of heavy rainfall and flooding in specific regions, enabling us to make informed decisions well in advance of potential disasters. Now, moving on to our second map, uh, this one is particularly significant when it comes to anticipatory action. What we're looking at in this map uh, is actually illust an illustration of the population that will be potentially affected by floods triggered by a 100-year rainfall return event. This map is designed to show us the areas exposed to flooding when the amount of rainfall exceeds the river basin thresholds. These thresholds are crucial because they determine when the conditions trigger flood events. By overlaying this data, we gain a clear understanding of where the highest exposure lies and can anticipate which communities are most exposed to flooding. This information equips us with the insights needed to implement measures that can protect these populations and mitigate the impact of significant flooding events. While the maps provide us with a visual representation of the flood-affected areas, we understand the importance of having detailed tabular data to complement these visuals. We've developed a comprehensive summary for the population affected by flood, which is a 100-year rainfall return uh, period. In the Philippines at the uh, of course, barangay level. By breaking the data down to the barangay level, we gain a granular view of the areas that require our immediate attention. With a combination of visual maps and detailed tabular data, we are better equipped to take proactive measures and protect our citizens from the impact of extreme rainfall and flooding events. In conclusion, our commitment to anticipatory action as exemplified through our innovative tools and resources empowers us to better prepare, to be better prepared to protect our communities, reduce the impact of disasters, and ultimately save lives. By providing timely, localized, and actionable information, we bridge the gap between anticipation and action, ensuring the safety and resilience of our citizens. I would like to acknowledge and express my appreciation to our team members who have poured their passion into making this vision a reality. It's a privilege to work alongside such a dedicated group of individuals who are not only filled with passion, but also with compassion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mahar, for outlining Project NOAA's impactful journey in disaster preparedness. Um, I think the team, the entire team's innovation and dedication has been instrumental in safeguarding communities and setting a very good benchmark for proactive disaster management. Um, so now we will move on to our next speaker, who is going to walk us through the government perspectives on technological tools presented by Ms. Alejandra Rivera. Alejandra Rivera is the manager of the Operations Center under the Quezon City Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office. 
Ms. Rivera entered the field of disaster risk reduction and management a year ago, designated as the operations center resident meteorolo meteorolo sorry, meteorologist. She was primarily responsible for monitoring the day-to-day -day weather conditions in Quezon City, as well as its um, severe impacts on the local communities. Over to you, Ms. Rivera. Hello, thank you. Uh, hello, uh, good morning, uh, good day to everyone. So for um, the government perspective on uh, technological tools, uh, especially with Mr. Lagmais, uh, with Dr. Lagmais, uh, Project NOAA, uh, flood monitoring and forecasting as a whole is a challenge for a city home to millions of people like Quezon City. Well, we know what areas usually experience flooding and how much it can affect our communities. We do not have enough tools and capacity yet to respond to this hazard in a timely manner. Uh, for example, um, on situations where heavy rainfall falls on the city, it may take us hours just to respond to the help of uh, to the calls for help uh, that our citizens send to us. In disaster risk reduction and management, UPRI's flood forecasting tool will be a tremendous help to us in keeping up with flooding in a highly urban setting. For example, it can be integrated with QCTRMO's existing early warning systems, such as our sensor network in the city's uh, dashboard for hazard monitoring, and thus uh, enable my office to produce timely, informed actions in all thematic areas of disaster risk reduction and management more promptly, uh, which will then uh, cascade to swifter disaster response and the city that is better capacitated towards responding to the challenges of urban flooding. It is my hope uh, that this tool will improve and develop more in the uh, in the near future. And uh, if I may, um, having features such as short-term flood forecasting and, of course, um, better, more accurate predictions to urban flooding will better help Quezon City and, of course, um, uh, other cities that will use tools such as this to mitigate, prepare, and respond to the challenges of the times. Thank you. Thank you for the insightful presentation. I think it's always necessary to understand the on-the-ground on the realities of how a tool works. When we learn, um, that helps make the technology even better. So now we will shift gears and we will learn a bit about a technology to help monitor drought in Lesotho. So introducing simulating plant production using aqua crop model is Ms. Emponiane Natale, who is a PhD candidate at the National University of Lesotho. Ms. Natale is a laboratory demonstrator and PhD candidate in the Department of Soil Science and Resource Conservation at the National University of Lesotho. Her research focuses on the assessment and monitoring of drought in Lesotho, impacts on crop performance and crop yield projections. She has participated in climate change impact on wetlands and land degradation assessment in dryland areas, specifically assessing the impacts of land degradation on water resources. She was recently a member of the drought scoping study in Lesotho. Over to you. I'm, I'm happy, uh, highly appreciate this time for me to present about the, the, the crop model. The, the presentation is all about simulating plant production using the aqua crop. Uh, we will first of all look into the, the background of, of Lesotho. Lesotho seems to be uh, experiencing a lot of impacts and shocks due to climate change. And we found that climate drought is the most a frequent and prevalent hazard in the in the last uh, 100 years. Studies also indicated that there was an increase in drought-related emergencies that were recorded over a 25-year period. Uh, specifically, in the last 10 years, the country, the whole country experienced three extreme droughts, which were in 2011, 2012, 2015, 2016, as well as 2018, 2019. The main impacts of this has been food insecurity, 
drought have the most severe impacts on agricultural as well as socioeconomic as they reduce the natural resource-based livelihood, thus creating their vulnerabilities. Also, the temperature in Lesotho is also projected to increase by 1.72 to 2.2 degrees Celsius by 2060. And therefore, the soil quality and livestock productivity is expected to be negatively impacted uh, throughout the, in the hydrological cycle, causing the dry spells, trout, as well as uh, flash floods. Therefore, the, the objective now, the objective now is to use the crop model too, which is aqua crop, in order to improve the crop production for the coming years, in order to be more resilient to climate change. Specifically, we would like to understand the crop responses to environmental change, to develop irrigation schedules for maximum production, to also study the effect of climate change on food production, basically to address the issues on food insecurity. Uh, these days, there's a lot of, of progression in technology as well as in, in research. Specifically, agricultural research and technology adoption seem to be playing an important role in improving the productivity and therefore create a, generate an optimistic impact on the household livelihood. There are technological tools that can be implemented to increase the effectiveness of the anticipatory action even a, before a research can be conducted. <clears throat> then one would like to know what is an aqua crop. Aqua crop is a crop crop model that has been developed by land and water division of uh, FAO, mainly to address food security. What it does, it simulates yield responses to water of herbaceous crops, but it is particularly suited to address conditions where water is the key limiting factor in crop production. Now, who can benefit from the from using this aqua crop? This tool is so invaluable to various uh, agricultural practitioners such as water managers and planners, extension services governmental agencies and non-governmental agencies, farmers and farmers association, as well as researchers. Now, when you are coming into the application of the, of the model, there are inputs that are required. We have weather data, crop characteristics, soil characteristics, as well as field management practices. So when one opens the first panel of the model, that is where we are coming to see that we have to input the climate data, which is the minimum and maximum air temperature, rainfall, the evapotranspiration. But the evapotranspiration calculator is embedded in the model. So after we have input all those, uh, evapotranspiration can easily be calculated. We input the crop, in this case, we're talking about the crop varieties. Uh, we come to soil, soil characteristics, uh, the soil texture that one will be planting. And thereafter, we are talking about the management, the field management practices, as well as the irrigation management practices that can be employed. Therefore, after all this data has been input into the model, the model act like an engine. And then after we have run, we have input the data, the model runs and then produces the yield, depending on which type of, of plant or crop one is planting. If you have selected the maize, then after inputting the data, maize input will be, will be produced. The second panel, after we have input the data, Will, be, will reflect like this with a lot of um, tabs. The tabs here we have 
rain, soil water profile, soil salinity. Then if you are interested in the soil salinity during production, we open that. When we, op when we are interested in production, then we go and see how biomass is produced and how, how much of it is produced within that time, as well as the dry yield that has been produced within that time. So we therefore conclude that the plant responses to different um, climatic factors will be known for constructive decision making. Also, the, the anticipatory action measures can be done before the projected hazard before. And the amount of water that is needed for, for, for certain crop will also be known, creating the support on decision making, especially to farmers on improving their production. Thus, food security will be met in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Natalia, for this very timely presentation on a very useful tool. I think the adoption of um, crop rotting tools like AquaCrop can be an important strategy to enhance the resilience of understanding crop responses um, and developing irrigation schedules or addressing the impacts of climate change on food related uh, on food production. So now we're going to hear from Chaka uh, Ansane's perspective. Mr. Chaka Ansane is has a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy with specialization in plant and field crop physiology and potato production. He is currently a lead farmer in commercial table and seed potato production in Lesotho. His experience spans a period of 40 years in the agriculture sector. He has served a very various capacities in sectoral administration in Lesotho and South Africa. He has regional, he has served in regional and international organizations in agriculture. He has also served his country in various diplomatic portfolios worldwide. He is currently a commercial farmer and in this capacity, leading various initiatives to support the transition from subsistence to commercial farming in Lesotho. Over to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. The way that we have been dealing with drought in Lesotho is that uh, when it occurs, there is a clarion call for everyone to go down on knees and pray. There's also public awareness campaigns and the different uh, farming calendars and practices are often uh, indicated, but they are only in lip service because practically speaking, those are never actualized. There are emergency interventions that are not predictable. The, what farmers would like is that they should be able to assess crop behavior on different soils, to also draw conclusions on the suitability of soils for various crops, to be able to assess soil moisture requirements for different crops and to monitor crop yield levels, but also to determine the correct planting dates for different crops in varying agronomic circumstances in a changing climate. And then, of course, to observe soil characteristics and nutrient levels and assess suitable husbandry practices. Farmers would also like research based findings to align with planting dates, specific yield estimates, and therefore cropping systems according to locations, but also structured and targeted messages to farmers according to commodities research-based farming systems in line with agroecological zones and targeted interventions based on specific crops and not only to praying and to adjust planting dates. Challenges that farmers face are soil fertility correction recommendations, which are too general and do not take account of fertility gradients within the field. Also, small soil moisture management recommendations are too general and disregard gradients in moisture gradients within the field. Pest management recommendations are equally too general. Inadequate access to appropriate technology is a problem. Difficult access to finance, difficult access to inputs, and difficult access to markets. Thank you very much. And we're saying that if we, Wishes were horses, farmers would 
ride, but I think we are about to ride once we have the aqua crop model. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chaka, for highlighting the uh, various ways that the tools work for farmers and also for highlighting the ways that there are challenges remaining for farmers. And all that usually means is that there is so much more potential um, for a technology to become better as the process goes along. So I've, as we've seen through the wonderful presentations and heard from real-time users, these models predict drought and flood outcomes that are essential for mitigating the impact of these disasters as they help users like us enable proactive measures to protect communities and their resources. However, we also understand that technology is an iterative process. So um, we're going to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar now. If everybody could please also insert their um, questions into the chat, because I'm not sure if the Q&A is working and then we'll sift through those. So I'm going to be, I have one first for all four of our panelists. What measures are in place to address the potential limitations and challenges of the current version of the either the flood or the drought model technology, such as data accuracy, timeliness, and adaptability of the system to evolving climate conditions? Um, so first, uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Mahar, and please try to limit the answer to one minute. I know it's hard, but we'll, we'll try. Yeah, but thank you very much, Akiti. Uh, of course, uh, there are limitations uh, in science. We need to declare the limitations of the methods used. And in this tool, it's the same. While anticipatory action tools and our new features have numerous capabilities, there are certain limitations as well. And these aspects may not... Uh, uh, be fully addressed. And these tools rely on weather forecasts and weather predictions may occasionally be, of course, uh, not perfect. They may be at sometimes inaccurate, leading, leading to the risk of false alarms or missed warnings. Back to you. Thank you. Um, now, Natalia, the same question for you. Thank you. The limitations that we have in aqua crop Firstly, the aqua crop simulated the daily biomass production and final crop yield only for herbaceous crops, which have the single growth cycle. Uh, secondly, the aqua crop is designed to predict crop yield at a single field scale. That is, the, the field is assumed to be uniform without special differences in crop development, transpiration, and other management. Yeah, those are the limitations that we have in the model. Thank you. So I think a little different version of the question for our real-time users is you both mentioned how this um, impacts different groups of people on the ground differently. And Chaka also mentioned how there are um, variations with how farmers might perceive the information. So with um, just questions around data literacy and who, which social demographic groups might not be able to understand such important um, data. I'd like to ask both our both of our real time users if they think there are any ways that um, these tools can be disseminated in a manner that they are more adaptable for different um, populations that we want to work with. So over to you, um, Alejandra first. Uh, hello. Uh, so for Kazan City. Um, We've been working on involving uh, our stakeholders in the local government council, as well as the uh, external agencies and the general public when it comes to disseminating the the, the tools that we use for um, monitoring hazards. I think one of the biggest um, help to us is uh, social media. Uh, due to the sheer engagement that we get from the general public there. And um, from, from what uh, I've experienced, um, you, you start small, for example, uh, with sharing um, some of your tools, uh, what we use, for example, in um, monitoring the weather in Quezon City. And then um, it involves uh, the right sort of person like um, the representatives of our agencies and other stakeholders, and then things will ca cascade from there. Thank you. 
Now, um, Mr. Natsani, the same question to you. Um, thank you. The the um, there are various groups within the communities to which uh, targeted messages must be formulated. For example, example, the head has community based groups as well as schools. These messages need to be targeted there so that uh, they can become common uh, cause um, conversations among the groups. But finally, also on accuracy of data, for example, in our production group, um, the data is not accurate. We don't quite know what it costs now to produce potatoes on, an, on a hectare of land or how what it costs to produce a ton of potatoes. So that kind of information needs to be disseminated accurately to all those that have to use it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, so we'll uh, move to that now. Also, everybody, if you have more questions, please add them to either the chat or the Q&A. So the first question, um, I will read it from Enrique Arias. I have two questions for the first presenter. So that would be Dr. Mahar. First, would you consider that anticipatory action would reduce or mitigate efforts to address vulnerabilities? And secondly, I would like to know if the population affected by the hazard has the opportunity to review and validate the hazard maps. In some cases, the maps are mainly used by humanitarian and public agencies at the national level. I am curious to know if you involve other stakeholders in the validation of these maps. Over to you. Yeah. Um, the, the maps that we prepared um, have been validated on a year-to-year -year basis by, by Netizens, as well as the efforts that we've been doing uh, in the field. So every time it rains, every time there's a typhoon, there are pictures uh, crowdsourced from the people. They come out in social media, they're in Twitter, on Facebook. We collate all of those and uh, we try to investigate whether the flood maps that we have created are accurate or not. And we found out that the accuracy is more than 90%. It's not 100%, but I, I believe that 90% is, is quite high. And that applies also for the other hazard maps that we have produced for landslides as well as storm surges when they happen. Um, with regards to the the earlier question, because there were, I believe, two parts of that question, I believe that these tools, uh, of course, uh, would help or could help uh, in 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 mitigating uh, potential impacts of disasters because they empower the people, they give information, and knowledge is power. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Ch uh, Dr. Mahar. So we have one more question in the Q&A um, from Bindi Borg. This says, we seem to be talking about reaching to, to challenges, reacting to challenges. I'm interested in building scenarios and creating desired futures. Do you know of anyone doing that in nutrition and food production? So I wonder if that is more for Natalie. Uh, to respond to the question, in my case, what uh, I do in as much as I'm looking at the the future trades. Uh, I'll be looking at the performance of crops, how they will perform when the, the temperature or climatic factors are at this range. Uh, I'll not be going deeper into nutrition, but the yield now, uh, in the coming years, I'll be able to predict the, the, the yield for meaning the, the crop production. Now the nutrition part and food production, I won't go deeper to that section. Okay, so now I have another um, broad question. Um, so when we're talking about technology and tools like this, um, we often do have to take into account socioeconomic and in fact infrastructural disparities that can that are present in different regions and communities of the countries we're working in. So what strategies can be employed either at an organization level within our different um, sectors or at a policy level um, to potentially address these potential inequalities in regards to the access and the benefits from this technology? technology. So this would be to ensure its equitable impact in disaster preparedness and response. Um, so I think this is also applicable to everybody. 
Um, sorry, Aliana, we can start with you, if you'd like. Um, so for for Quezon City, um, one that is actually one of the biggest challenges that we have. Um, the more tools and systems that we acquire to, um mitigate and prepare for disasters uh we we get a clearer image of uh just how much um the general public may not know or uh understand what we're doing in um DRRM so for that um we generally have two approaches um we have uh analog tools such as um, markers, for example, that we put up in our local community so that they have a better idea of um, uh, how flooding, for example, uh, as the hazard that we're talking about, uh, has an impact on, on their communities, uh, what flood heights, what certain flood heights mean for um for their properties and their livelihoods, and of course, we we try to capacitate the general public as much as we can. Whether it's in the form of trainings or um, seminars, not only with uh, stakeholders in the local and national government, but also especially with the civil society organizations that we have in Quezon City, we we do our best to communicate the functions and the um, purposes of the technologies and the tools that we acquire for um for disaster preparation and mitigation i i i've always been asked this question for the longest time every year um there there are in 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 the, in the simplest form the question would be how about those who do not have access to such technologies? Um, well, the Philippines is, I think, one of the uh, uh, most the country with the most number of users for for social media tools. And although we recognize that not everybody have access to to the internet, uh, still we do recognize that we must use the technologies whenever it is. Uh, possible for us to use them and in fact maximize their use we're not saying that it's the only tool it can be used to come to to uh, to address certain aspects uh, it can be used as a tool as a complement to the other methods of communication that we've had before and it's just a a tool that can be integrated to an entire system one of the tools among many Thank you, Dr. Mahar. Um, Natalie, would you like to answer that next? The floor is yours. I don't have anything to say at this point. Okay. And Mr. Natsani? Yes, thank you very much. In, in Lesotho circumstances, um, we think that um, inclusive participation of all groups at the community level in planning and dissemination of information, particularly uh, because we do have um, community group meetings that are organized by chiefs, and this is one effective way of disseminating information. Thank you. Thank you. So when we're tying all of these themes and elements together, um, what do each of you think that this means for AA programming? So if we had to integrate this into an existing program, what would that look like and what are the implications? Um, so whoever would like to go first. Uh, I think I'll start first. Uh, I think for for us, at least in the context of um, anticipatory action can be um, applied to prevention and mitigation as well as um, preparedness programs. So, um, so we have um, various projects, for example, infrastructures that can um, prevent and mitigate the uh, impact of hazards. And then we also, I think AA uh, projects can also be uh, applied to capacity building, which I think is very 
crucial. Um, in capacity building, of course, we we aim to uh, inform and enable uh, our participants, especially in the general public, on the impacts uh, of a hazard and the actions that uh, they can do to prepare themselves for um, not only the worst case scenario, but um, to the uh, slightly uh, less worse uh, incidents that may happen in their day-to-day uh, -day lives. And um, uh, the tools uh, that uh, that have been presented here today, I think, um, can be used to uh, enhance uh, those programs for sure. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. Uh, Kriti? Go ahead, Dr. Mahar. <laughs> yeah. I, I've always believed that planning is the quintessential anticipatory action. So these tools that we have been creating provide us with information uh, so that we can take action. And that kind of information transforms into knowledge if it is beneficial to us, if we are able to make it useful to us. Uh, it gives us information such that we can take the appropriate action. And it's much, much better than having no information at all. So such things are very important. And uh, if they are used well by the community, by everybody, it empowers them. And it is a good basis for helping themselves because they are empowered with the tools and the information. Thank you. Thank you. We take it. Uh, thank you very much. We currently have a poultry crisis in Lesotho because uh, our neighboring country on whom we depend for imports of almost all food has had an outbreak of disease and uh, there is no importation of poultry projects or uh, products. It is only now that uh, across the society, government, farmers, and all other groups realize that they should have had tools for anticipatory action. And so when this uh, um, tool that's proposed by NUL is, not, is applied, then we will be able to know that we should anticipate that there can be closure of, closure of borders and that there cannot be any importation and that we must at all times be vigilant and make sure that we are prepared for crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Natalia, I could see you were about to speak, so the floor is yours. Yes. Yeah, one other thing is after the, the model maybe has been implemented, and the, the the farmers, now that they are at the forefront of food production, if they can be able to use this well, I believe that uh, their production will be improved. Also, even before the production, the anticipatory measures can well be put in place before we are talking about drought. If we project that in a, second, in a certain year, there will be much higher drought then farmers will be able to, 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 to take precaution of whatever will, will come at the, uh, to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all very valuable points. I know I still have a lot more questions, a, a lot of questions to ask, but I think we're also closing in on our time now. So as we conclude, I'd like all four of our wonder, wonderful panelists to please consider this. If there is one key takeaway from today's discussion on anticipatory action and technology, what would it be? So please try to, again, limit your answer to one minute each, even though I know it's difficult. Um, and we will begin with Aleander again. Uh, I think for uh, my, my one takeaway here is that uh, it's an anticipatory action is uh, nothing that... Uh, we haven't been doing already but it's very important to uh, always keep our minds open and um seize any opportunity to learn more uh, about what uh, what else we can do uh, 
we will never have uh the complete image of anything especially in um dealing with hazards and disasters but that's not really stopping us to uh to try and learn things try to integrate more things technologies and, and tools into what uh, we're doing in disaster response thank you that's a very valuable point dr mahar would you like to go next yes yes uh, thank you Akiti. <laughs> um yeah the, the the message would be really we've been talking about all of these technologies uh, I'd like to say that the anticip anticipatory action is not just about the technologies. Um, these tools provide information for anticipatory action, but they do not directly facilitate the execution of response activities. Coordination, resources, and response mechanisms need to be in place to act on the information provided. And it's really about collaboration among communities, governments, and organizations. Thank you. Natalie? Yeah, what uh, I can say is that the advances in technology, as well as the analytics, are making it very easier to accurately forecast the, the weather events, the, the, the severe weather events. So this helps enable the anticipatory action that is acting before a predicted disaster such as flood or drought in order to prevent or minimize its impact on people. Also, the modern farms now and agricultural operations work far differently than those in a few decades ago, primarily because of the advancements in technology including the sensors, we have devices, machines, as well as the information technology. Thank you. Thank you, Ntale. Mr. Nakani, over to you. Yes. Um, what we take away from here is that neither government nor anyone else indeed can do it alone. Therefore, the effort by our national university to develop this model is going to have a national impact. And therefore, we, we realize that uh, for the first time, we need to recognize the efforts from the university. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And we really appreciate your time today. As our panelists have highlighted anticipatory action and technology, um, the integration is only just beginning. It is going to get stronger. And it also depends on massive stakeholder engagement, such as us participating in this webinar and getting to learn a lot more about how these technologies work and how we can make them better. So thank you again for everybody for coming. Um, the recordings will be available and the links will be provided to everybody after the webinar.